Ah, <sighs> okay, so 2022. All right, cool. Hello Internet, this is Owen from what I'm listening to. I hope you all are continuing to stay safe, stay healthy, keeping those hands nice and clean, and continuing to wear that mask when you go outside and inside. We still gotta wear them, I'm sorry. That's how it is. Well, here we are, two years later, and uh, yeah, we're uh, doing that uh, top 10 of 2020 list. At this point, it seems like 2020 has been dubbed the lost year, and uh, I guess you could say the same thing about uh, this video. Even though I was actively listening to albums that came out in 2020, the uh, height of the pandemic made uh, things a bit difficult to actually uh, make this here video. So before we dive into the list, let's just take a minute to talk about why the hell this video is so late. So day one of lockdown, my girlfriend and I move into the apartment we are currently in right now. And there was a lot of uncertainty behind that because first off, the uh, whole pandemic thing was really, really scary. And we also weren't really sure we were gonna be moving forward with this move. We had been working on getting this apartment for a while and uh, by the time it came to uh, the actual move date, we were told to stay in place. And also because of that, we weren't even sure if we were going to be able to get some help hauling all our crap from one spot to the next, so that created a lot of stress. But thank God we were able to get the help, and uh, we successfully moved from one spot to the next. But of course, when you move into a new place, you end up kind of living out of boxes for the first couple weeks, maybe even the first month of moving, and uh, that's exactly what we did. What also didn't help was the fact that we weren't able to get any new furniture to store our records, our books, uh, any miscellaneous stuff we didn't have a space for. So they just lived on the floor in a box, in a pile, just in the middle of our kitchen. And that stretch of time alone was really strange because we weren't working, we couldn't go anywhere, so we were just left to just sit around and do whatever we could to entertain ourselves, which was mostly just browsing the internet and watching TV, which got old quick. It even got to the point where we were going to bed at like 2 or 3 in the morning and then waking up at 12 or 1 p.m. the next day. But eventually, I ended up going back to work about a month and a half into lockdown, which was pretty okay because it meant that I was bringing in some money and I could kind of get back into a routine. But unfortunately, this is also when my mental health started to plummet. Because of all this uncertainty in the air, working in the service industry became such a grueling task. Things just felt much more unpredictable. People were really difficult to deal with. Not to go into too much detail about it, but from the time I started and the months going on, I started to slip in a really dark place mentally and it really affected my personality. I became a pretty difficult person to be around just because I was so miserable and I just didn't know what to do about it, nor if I could do anything about it. It was both a really unpleasant experience for me and anyone else who had to interact with me. But by the end of 2020, going into 2021, I completely switched careers and uh, have become a much happier person and hopefully much more pleasant to be around. And as you can imagine, all this negative stimuli left me completely unmotivated and drained of any creativity. So the last thing I wanted to do was make content and God forbid, make a best of 2020 video. However, I never forgot. It wasn't like I wasn't gonna do it. The, the idea of making this video was burning in my mind. And I knew at some point, I was going to do it. And uh, two years later, here we are. We're going to do it. We're going to do this, and then we're going to do the top 10 of 2021 because I've neglected to do that one too. So consider this a part one of a double feature. I'll be posting uh, the next list very soon after this. But uh, with all of that being said, let's finally dive in to what my top 10 albums of 2020 are. Number 10. Starting off the list at number 10 is actually something that never was released on CD, but something I want to highlight regardless. That particular album is Seer Believer's Bent. Now 
See Your Believer is a project formed by multi-instrumentalist Nick Mansk, who started writing the songs on this album between the years of 2018 and 2019. In fact, Nick contributed about 90% of the instruments on the recording of this album, with the remaining 10% being from Charlie O'Neill, who's the drummer of the band Gleamer. And the pair were able to accomplish a modern-day take on the slowcore or emo genre, whatever you want to refer to it here. The core of these tracks, no pun intended, is very similar to that of 90s slowcore bands. Very slow tempos, depressing and introspective lyrics, twinkly guitars, and beautiful, beautiful melodies. But in the case of Bent, they also have a bit of a heavier sound to their music that really echoes the works of the Deftones or Hum. The final product is an album that makes you both want to thrash and weep at the same time. As a fan of all those aforementioned influences, the sound of this album was incredibly appealing to me. It honestly fills me with joy to see that there are newer bands out there that are taking influence on this slowcore emo genre and evolving it and making it into their own sound. And some of you might write this album off simply because I use the descriptor emo to describe the album, but I can assure you, it's nothing like emo music that came out in the uh, 2000s. This is something completely different. If you're a fan of emotional or dramatic, pretty sounding music that's got an edge to it, then definitely check this album out. Really, really, really cool stuff from this. I wish they released it on CD so I could uh, show you a physical copy, but it is available digitally on their Bandcamp, and you can get a vinyl copy if you want that. And it was good enough to be featured on my number 10 slot. Number nine. At number nine, we have Adrian Lenker's Songs and Instrumentals. While 2020 was a year filled with uncertainty, it was also a year full of creativity because a lot of musicians were forced to shelter in place. They had to figure out something to do to kill time and thus a lot of them wrote music, recorded music, and we got a large influx of albums that came out. And amongst those albums, was this one. Adrian is best known for being a member of the band Big Thief, which is an excellent group to check out. After Big Thief was forced to cancel their 2020 European tour, Adrian retreated to a cabin in Massachusetts, completely isolating herself in the woods, where she ended up writing all the songs that appear on this album. Eventually, she invited her friend and audio engineer, Phil Weinrobe, to come out to the cabin where he could help record those songs. Now, some of you might consider this being too albums packed in one, one album being songs and one album being instrumentals, but for the sake of this video I am qualifying this as one album. Partly because they were recorded in the same time frame and partly because they are packaged together here. So starting off with disc one, aka songs, this is where the uh, fully fleshed out songs live, hence the title. Unlike the songs she does on Big Thief, her solo work is completely stripped back. It's just her vocals, her acoustic guitar, a little bit of overdubs just as far as vocal harmonies goes, and for these recordings she used an assortment amount of brush in the area to serve as percussions. All of this really sets the tone of what this album is trying to achieve. It's very raw and barren, but also very natural sounding. Her vocals are incredibly beautiful on here. Her lyrics feel very intimate because of just how barren the recordings are. And her guitar playing is sparse, but still intricate at the same time. Meanwhile, on disc two, we have the uh, instrumentals, hence the title of it being instrumentals. During the cabin recording sessions, Adrian would begin and end the day doing some sort of improvised piece on the guitar. All of these pieces were recorded, and when it came time to mix and master the album, Adrian and Phil picked out their favorite pieces and combined them together to make up the two 10 plus minute tracks on this CD. And it's these two tracks that you really get a sense of the environment the pair were recording and working in. Every little recorded ditty on here is accompanied with some sort of natural sound. Trees swaying in the wind, the sounds of birds in the distance, rain pouring outside, uh, the sound of crackling from a fire in the fireplace, and uh, chimes, which make up the majority of the aptly named track, Mostly Chimes. 
I honestly wish they included every single recorded piece on the album because I could listen to them all freaking day. So if you're a fan of folk and ambient music, then this is an album well worth checking out. It is easily one of the prettiest sounding albums that came out in 2021. Number eight. At number eight, we have Taylor Swift's album, Folklore. And when I felt like I was an old cardigan someone's bed you put me on and said I was your favorite seeing as this video is two years late it seems like a complete no-brainer to include Taylor Swift in this list uh, but for the sake of content we're gonna talk about it Taylor really threw us a curveball with this album instead of making another synth pop dance pop album like she did on 1989 and reputation she decided to make an album that's much more somber and subdued, very reminiscent of a lot of the uh, indie folk acts that have appeared over the years. And this is due to the fact that Taylor reached out to Aaron Dessner, who's best known for being in the band The National, to help write and record a good chunk of the songs on here, while the rest of the songs she worked with her longtime producer Jack Antonoff. And the end result is just amazing. There's a much more fantastical approach to Taylor's lyrics on here. Each song seems to tell a story of a different character that kind of ranges from sounding playful and charming to dark and dramatic. While all of this is enhanced by Desner's very somber instrumentation that's pretty much identical to the stuff he does on The National. It's honestly a collaboration I didn't think I needed until I actually heard it. If anything, this album really shows how versatile Taylor can be, and it makes me really excited to see what else she has up her sleeve in the future. At this point, she could do anything. And something to mention, I almost combined this with Evermore because the two came out super close together and sound very similar to one another, but I ended up just picking this one because it's the one I kept going back to the most. And there's nothing wrong with Evermore, it's a damn fine album, but between the two, I like this one the most. So if you're gonna dive into these albums, then you should definitely listen to both of them, but Folklore is definitely my favorite. Number seven. At number seven, we have The Bats, Foothills. Was lit, even the, shadows were cool. the Bats have been around since the 1980s, and they're one of the premier bands signed onto the Flying Nun label. They're also one of the bands that really helped develop the Doondin sound, which is a sound very specific to bands from southern New Zealand. But despite having been around for that long and being pretty active in that process, this is actually the first Bats album I ever listened to. It just happened to be playing at Amiibo one day when I was shopping, and I just loved how it sounded, so I bought it on a whim, and well, here it is now. Foothills has this very mellow and atmospheric sound that comes off as very charming and playful. And the songs on here are simple, yet they are rich in melody, some ranging from low-key and some ranging into more bouncy territory. It's to the point where at least one song on this album is likely to get stuck in your head. And that song for me was Scrolling, which is this very slow, psychedelic track that borderlines being an alternative country song. It just might be my favorite song that came out in 2020. A longtime fan of The Bats once told me that this album sounds pretty similar to the more recent stuff the band has come out, which I kind of took into consideration when I was rating this album, but I overall really, really enjoyed the experience of this. I think anybody who's new to the band who really enjoys easygoing music will definitely enjoy this one, and even if you're unfamiliar with the band or familiar with the band, you should definitely check it out. It's really, really good stuff. Number six. Staying on the topic of easygoing music, at number six, I have Maya Hawke's Blush. I am not a coward. My first exposure to Maya was seeing her on a season of Stranger Things, and when I was looking her up online, that's when I learned that she's the daughter of Uma Thurman and Ethan Hawke, and she went to Juilliard for a time, but ended up dropping out so she could pursue acting. So it really came to no surprise when I found out she was releasing an album, but 
I didn't expect to like it as much as I did. Like I said before, the stuff on here is very mellow and easygoing and charming. It honestly reminds me a lot of Nora Jones' Come Away With Me with the uh, country, jazz, and soft rock approach. But uh, unlike Nora's very powerful voice, Maya's is a lot softer, which I feel like matches the music on here. The first time I actually listened to the album, my girlfriend and I were staying at home and we were just working on some random art project, and it just really enhanced that experience. I not only enjoyed the music, but it just kind of provided that Ah, feeling. But sadly, I feel like this is an album that flew completely under people's radars. Maybe people thought it was too generic, or maybe people just weren't familiar with Maya Hawk at all. Whatever the reasoning is, I encourage all of you to check this album out. It was a really pleasant experience, which I hope everybody could feel when they listen to this. And it also makes me excited to see if Maya continues making music in addition to acting. And if she puts out another album in the future, you can bet I'm gonna get it. Number five. At number five, I have Clippings, Visions of Bodies Being Burned. This bitch boss. Call her out her name wrong step. Step up, got you then dip. This bitch boss. Come in talking that shit. And you gonna have to die about it. Following up their 2019 release, There Existed an Addiction to Blood, this is yet another experimental horrorcore album that kicks all sorts of ass. Much like the miscellaneous slasher movie franchises from the 80s and 90s, this album feels like a direct sequel from the last one, providing more of the same, and then some. There's a lot more features from both rappers and other experimental musicians, as if they're the newest victims to the horror movie that is this album. My all-time favorite moment on this album is is the Witchboard interlude going into the 96 Nerve Campbell song. It sets the tone with these two women playing with the Ouija board, and neither of them can really tell if the other person is goofing around or if it's some kind of sick joke or something's really happening. They end up spelling out the message, he is here, and before they have time to question what that means, there's a booming knock on the door, which kicks right into the next song. To me, that moment really embodies what this album is trying to do. Make dark music that sends chills down your spine, while also having amazing production and sound design. I get goosebumps every time I hear that song, maybe out of fear or maybe out of just how good it sounds. If you were a fan of the previous release from this, then you need to hear this one too. You could do a double feature, listen to the first one and listen to this one back to back. And if you're new to the band and you want to hear some amazing experimental hip hop, then absolutely check these guys out. These guys make some amazing music and should be paid close attention to. Number four. At number four, we have car seat headrests making a door less open. Just when I think I'm gone, you change the This is a band that has really evolved over the years, starting from one guy making sad, raw-sounding songs in the uh, garage of his parents' house, to a full-fledged band making more refined-sounding sad songs. What's even cooler is the band has kind of created this tradition where they've been going back and re-recording the songs that were done when the project was just one person to bring a whole new light and a more full sound. This album, however, was a bit of a curveball, especially for the longtime followers of the band. Instead of following the usual alternative rock sound that they'd been doing with the last few albums, they decided to do a little bit more experimentation, incorporating a lot more synths and weird noises. Not to mention, we get to hear vocal contributions from other members of the band. Guitarist Ethan Ives sings lead on one song, and drummer Andrew Katz shouts on another song. But despite the radically different approach they took on this album, the band's core sound remains intact. Will Toledo is still a master at writing a song with a catchy melody and a catchy hook. And like I've said with some of these other releases, it makes me excited to see what else the band could do from here. I know some fans really dismiss this album because of that change, but I think they really knocked it out of the park on here. After a while, hearing a band just rehash the same sound over and over again gets pretty boring, and uh, this one felt very, very refreshing. I personally enjoyed this record and would be curious if they would still explore the sound or maybe even explore a different sound. Either way, I'm more than willing to listen to what they make. Anyone new to the band should definitely give this one a listen. I 
wouldn't start with this album because if you end up liking it and go back to the older albums, you might be kind of disappointed. So I would start with the earlier stuff and work your way on up to this one. If anything, you can kind of see the gradual evolution of where they started when the project was just one person, to the full band stuff, to what they're doing right now. Number three. Okay, we are getting to the final three albums, and at number three, we have Hums Inlet. The sunlight drips from the trees and forms and pools, wading through the oblivious and warm. From seemingly out of nowhere, Hum dropped this album after being completely silent for about 22 years. But as a longtime fan, it was really, really exciting to see they were making new music. And I really didn't realize just how much I missed their blend of post-hardcore, alternative metal, space rock, and shoegaze until I listened to this album. It's almost like they picked right back up from what they were doing in 1999. And it's honestly their heaviest sounding album to date, it borderlines being a post-metal album, but those shimmering guitars and the very small hints of dream pop still remain intact. It's a truly magnificent album that transports me to a different world every time I listen to it. And sadly, the band's longtime drummer Brian passed away only four days after this album was released. But I'm happy he was able to drum on one final hum release before he passed, because this one is certainly an achievement. His legacy will certainly live on with this album and all the other albums he was on. So rest in peace to Brian and welcome back, Hum. We really, really missed you and hope that you still continue to make more music in the future. Number two. At number two, we have Mac Miller's Circles. You're feeling sorry. I'm feeling fine. Don't you put any more stress on yourself. It's one day at a time. Oh man, this album. This album is both a curse and a blessing. On one hand, the music on here is some of the deepest and most mature music Mac has ever done, but on the other hand, it really highlights just how tragic his untimely death was. Before listening to this album, I chalked Mac up as just another popular rapper and kind of wrote him off because of it. But thanks to my girlfriend, she showed me the title track on here, Circles, which is the first song on here, and it made me realize I was really missing out. Circles the song wasn't just another generic rap song, it was this somber jazz influenced song sung by this raspy voiced Mac that sounded like he had been through hell and high water. The message that the lyrics were trying to convey had this sort of wisdom behind it, the kind of wisdom that can only be achieved when you've experienced hardship. Upon hearing the opening line, well, this is how it looks like right before you fall, I was left speechless. And the rest of the album does not let up. Songs range from being heartbreaking to bittersweet to encouraging. It's it's a total roller coaster. The way I interpret this album is sort of Mac's love letter to life as a whole. You're going to experience a ton of hardships that might make moving forward very difficult, but it's the good things in life that make it well worth living. The fact that Mac was able to make an album like this makes you wonder what he could have done in the future, but Sadly, we're never gonna know. Any of you watching this needs to listen to this album. It is seriously a beautiful, heartbreaking, amazing collection of songs. And be wary because when you go into it, it's gonna make you feel things. Number one. All right, internet, we are down to my number one pick. And that album is, of course, Daniel Avery and Alessandro Cortini's Illusion of Time. Like I said at the beginning of this video, when the pandemic really hit, there was a lot of uncertainty and fear looming in the air. It was really strange to see once populated areas of San Francisco completely deserted. Not to mention the myriad of businesses that were once thriving completely gone and shutting down because they just couldn't survive in the pandemic. It just made things feel so apocalyptic and bleak, like something out of a sci-fi thriller. And if I had to pick one album to adequately portray those feelings, this would be that album. Now, I already consider myself a fan of Daniel and Alessandro's solo music, so when I found out that they were collaborating to make one album, I knew that I had to listen to it. And when it finally came out and I listened to it for the first time, I knew this was my album of the year. The music on here is just so hazy and beautiful, but there's this sort of 
creepy element to it. Again, just really echoing how things felt when the pandemic really started. It just felt like the soundtrack to this sci-fi thriller. If anything, if a movie was made out of lockdown, this would be the perfect score for it. And the title, Illusion of Time, is kind of fitting, especially for that month where I was in lockdown. Every day just kind of felt like a blur. Staying up super late, getting up super late, days just kind of blended together to the point where there was really no time. It was just one consecutively long day and it just became sludgy, hazy, confusing. And when I came out of it, I just didn't know. It was like, oh shit, there's a whole world out here. What the hell happened in that time frame? I can't tell you how many times I listened to this album when we were in lockdown and when I was slowly making my way back into a normal routine. It just helped me get another grasp of the world and just really process what was going on during this weird time. My final thoughts, this is the album that embodies 2020. The strangeness, the haziness, the confusion, the uncertainty, but also the beauty that kind of came out of it as far as creativity and all the wonderful records that came out because of it. This album is incredible, and even if you're not a fan of Ambient or Drone, this is something well worth checking out. So congratulations to the two people behind this album. You've made my number one pick of 2020. Alrighty then, internet, that does it for me. Thank you all so very much for your patience and uh, me making this video. I will follow up with my top 10 of 2021 soon. For now, let me know what your top 10 albums of 2020 were. Leave a comment down below, I'd love to know. And if you also like this video, be sure to hit that subscribe button. It'll show me the support and I'll love your face for it. And you can also follow me on Instagram for even more music. I post a new album on there semi-frequently, talk a little bit about it, and it gives you a bit of an insight of what else is in my collection. So. Thank you all so very much for watching. This is Olin from What I'm Listening To, signing out. Goodbye.